Well, hello there. You're watching the press preview. A first look at what is on the front pages in the next half hour or so. Then we'll see what's making the headlines with the broadcaster and journalist Rachel Johnson and the Financial Times Whitehall editor Sebastian Payne. Great to see you both. Hello to you. Good evening. Good evening. As ever, we take a look at the front pages. The Metro then quoting the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, describing the sad end to Sarah Everard's life. She was just walking home. The Sun reports that a Metropolitan Police officer guarding Miss Everard's memorial site in Clapham is under investigation for sharing a tasteless joke about her case in a group text. The Financial Times, leading with the decision of several European governments to suspend use of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine in order to investigate whether it can lead to blood clots, though the World Health Organization has insisted there's no need. The Telegraph's headline, Chaos in EU over Oxford jab concerns. The paper says British scientists are baffled by the suspension. The Times says regulators in the UK and Europe have rushed to defend the continued use of the vaccine. Indeed, The Guardian points out that the European medicines regulator has stated there's no cause for concern. The Daily Mail suggests the move was a slight by the EU because the vaccine was made in Britain. The Daily Express brands the decision shameful, calling it groundless. And The Star, meanwhile, has the latest fallout from Piers Morgan's exit from Good Morning Britain. So lots to discuss. Rachel Johnson, Sebastian Payne are here. Uh, Rachel, should we start with the AstraZeneca news then? Um, what do you think of this abundance of caution uh, by European Union nations, despite uh, the European Medicines Agency suggesting that actually the, the, the risk of COVID outweighs the risk of, of side effects from this vaccine? <clears throat> Well, I mean, I think they're right. It's, I mean, obviously, we, you mentioned the Daily Mail's front page and they're making it into a political fight between uh, the UK and the EU. The, the, it's clear that the 40 million people have had the AstraZeneca vaccine, 11 million people in this country. There have been 35 to 40 cases of blood clots. Apparently, if you're not vaccinated, the chances of blood clots are higher than if you are. So it seems to me unconscionable that Europe, as Italy goes into another lockdown and um, trying to cope with its third wave of this virus and pandemic, that the Europeans are risking them all going back into lockdown. And uh, as Seb and I knew were saying mm. earlier, risking like European holidays. Yes, it's highly irresponsible. Yes. Absolutely. And, and, and that, I mean, more broadly, if, if, if everyone's vaccinated, we're all safe. If they're not, we're not, is kind of the basis of that, isn't it? Um, the Financial Times and AstraZeneca's jab rollout paused in Europe over blood clot fears. The German health minister specifically saying it's um, the very rare cerebral um, blood thrombosis, effectively, trying to be very specific about this. Um, but it is, as scientists have pointed out, Sebastian not uncommon to have clots, isn't it? That's part of the problem with this, is extrapolating the causal links, really. I know, and it's very odd there's something else that causes blood clots, a lot more of them, and a lot more serious, and that is COVID-19 itself. And that feels as if it's got lost in this whole debate, that it's really unfathomable the fact that Germany, France, Italy and Spain have all paused rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccine on data that is very dubious. Nobody can really explain why. And both the European Medical Agency has come out today and said there's no reason to stop giving the jabs. And obviously the UK's MHRA, which to prove the jabs. They've also said there's no evidence for this too. It's rather a sorry tale for AstraZeneca because this came into the whole process as the vaccine that was going to save the world, the cheap, affordable COVID jab that was very efficient, could be distributed easily. And we've seen that in the UK, 11 million jabs delivered already of just that single, um, that single producer. But the company's been blighted by a lot of issues. It's had the fact that it's had supply problems. There was questions over the data originally but we should have been in a place now where it is a good vaccine. It is clearly working. When you look at the death rates and hospitalisation rates in the UK, the AZ jab is a good thing. And this fear-mongering me really worries me. We've seen this before from Emmanuel Macron, and it can obviously have very deadly consequences, as Rachel was saying. Yes, and, and indeed... The... Go on, Rachel. I was just going to ask whether Sebastian knows, as he knows everything, 
whether the countries that are pausing the rollout of the AZ vaccine are offering uh, their pop civilian populations an alternate vaccine. The problem is that all the supply for vaccines has been done through the EMA centrally, and the EMA doesn't have a problem with the AstraZeneca vaccine. They've come out today and said, as far as we're concerned, you can keep on jabbing. It's up to individual countries to make that decision. And so they're not going to replace those supplies. And like the UK and many other parts of the world, the whole of Europe's vaccine strategy is based on AstraZeneca. So if they keep pausing it, and if European leaders keep raising doubts about the vaccine, that really doesn't bode well for, keep, for tackling the pandemic on the continent. Uh, and interestingly, actually, Rachel, um, sort of uh, next to your question, not quite similarly, Mexico has asked America for their doses of AstraZeneca, which they've not yet given permission for. They obviously wanted more studies done on the over 65. So while it's not being used, Mexico said, give it to us. So people still want it. But it is really important, isn't it, this, this vaccine, because it's cheaper and it only requires refrigeration, not freezing and all of that for the rollout to the rest of the world, which is why reputational damage to this vaccine, which has already been clobbered by the questions about its efficacy in over 65s, that could be really serious, couldn't it, globally? It could be. I mean, I think we're awaiting a kind of pan-European decision from uh, the, what's it, is it EMA, isn't it, Seb? Yeah. And it if, is, they, if they can pass it, good to go. I, I cannot see the obstacle in the countries, uh, they're up to a dozen European countries now, including really big ones, you know, like France, Italy, Germany and Spain have paused the rollout tonight. I think I think it's you know it would be actually an international incident if they did because as you said in your opening remarks it's not until we're all vaccinated that we're all safe. The Daily Telegraph then, British scientists are baffled as more nations cease use of the AstraZeneca vaccine, a chaos in Europe over the Oxford jab concerns. And uh, Rachel's already mentioned the Daily Mail, reckless EU snubs UK jab. Um, is it politics, do you think, or is this an abundance of caution uh, by our European neighbours, Sebastian? What, what's your bet on that? Oh, I, d I don't think it's really politics. I don't think... No matter how anybody knew feels about Brexit in the UK, I don't think they would stop giving COVID jabs just for politics, which is the what's being inferred on the Daily Mail and the Daily Express tomorrow. I think fundamentally, this is all about an abundance of caution. And the strategy the UK has taken is to act quite nimbly, especially for the state that our government has and to attack things by trying out new vaccines, doing the approval process at an expedited rate. And generally, it has paid off. The, for example, increasing the, the length between doses, that's something other countries have followed the UK's lead on that when it was found. That is actually the best way to get an effective vaccine there. Um, I have sympathy with this because no government wants to be responsible for vaccinating its population and creating extra problems. But the data is so low here. And as Rachel said at the beginning, actually, once you've had the vaccine, and uh, the, the amount of blood clots actually um, decreases. So it does seem as if there's a bit of a panic reaction. And I think this is all due to those earlier concerns with AstraZeneca, those concerns about over the 60 farms, which were unfounded, by the way, because there wasn't enough data when Germany made that decision that sent everybody in panic earlier in the, earlier in the year. And then the supply issues as well, that's simply been a contractual dispute between the EU and AstraZeneca. But hopefully we'll have a pause People will calm down, will look at the data and realise that, yes, it is fine. And that the WHO, Oxford University, the UK, the MHRA, they are all right on this. And it can start again quite soon because Europe's COVID situation is a pretty bad place. As we saw in one of the papers tomorrow, Italy's heading back into lockdown again. Yes, Germany and France also seeing rising figures. And hopefully, too, Rachel, people here in the UK will continue to have confidence in this vaccine because the uptake here has been um, largely extraordinary. Yes, I mean, and also when you turn up at a centre, I don't think that you can elect to choose one vaccine over another. I mean, I think it would be stupid of anybody to turn up and say, no, I don't want the Oxford vaccine, I want the Pfizer vaccine. If the Pfizer vaccine is there, then all well and good, ditto the Oxford one. I just can't understand it. The statistics don't seem to bear out so many of these European countries' abundance of caution as well. It's actually, it's not cautious, it's actually reckless not to continue the rollout of the vaccinations, given what's happening to the infection rates. I, I can't understand it at all.
Absolutely. But I, don't, I think I agree with Deb. It is not politics, I do, but I don't know what it is. Yeah, OK. And the interesting thing is that the, the, the worries about the over-65s and that efficacy, even raised by the French president, Sebastian, have been truly answered, have they not, here, with the vaccine gap that we now see between cases, depending what age you're in. So, that I mean, that hopefully has put that concern to bed, hasn't it, at least that one? Absolutely. And when these reports came out from Germany about the fact it wasn't going to get approved for over 65s, it wasn't because there wasn't data or data to the contrary. It's because they didn't have enough of it. They were saying we're not going to approve this because we're not certain enough. But really what you're seeing in the UK is a mass trial. You know, it's said 11 million people plus 7 million of these jabs have been delivered across the EU already. And when you look, there is a very clear um, mark now on those charts between the effects of lockdown and social distancing, but clearly the effect the vaccine. The key thing the AstraZeneca jab has done is to break that link between infections and serious illness, because that's what's caused all the problems over the past year, that people get COVID, a certain portion get them get very ill, and in a certain portion of those end up in hospital. That's the key thing that governments have been trying to address. And whether it's Pfizer, AstraZeneca or Moderna, all those vaccines do seem to have done that. I should say on the AZ jab, though, the key indication of this, of course, will be America, that the director of the National National Health Institute, which is the U.S. equivalent of the MHRA. They are currently reviewing the data, and the U.S. could approve AstraZeneca within a month. And if that does happen, then that could certainly put the whole world in a much better place in trying to rebuild some of that much needed confidence in this jab. Absolutely. And the European uh, Medicines Regulator, we understand, meeting tomorrow, decision hopefully by Thursday. So we'll see if this is indeed a, a temporary pause. Um, both of you, thank you so much for now. Plenty more still to come, including as the fallout from the Sarah Everard case continues, we will discuss the parallel issues of women's safety and the right to protest. Join us after the break. Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview. With me now, Rachel Johnson and Sebastian Payne. Welcome back. Here you, there you are. Welcome back to both of you. Um, plenty of coverage uh, also about the Sarah Everard murder, the vigil that we saw at the weekend, the statement from Priti Patel uh, in the House of Commons today and the policing bill. It's all kind of wrapped together now, isn't it, Sebastian? Uh, the Metro taking it very straight, really. Priti Patel's heartache over Sarah. She was just walking home. The five words that sum up the emotions that have triggered this outpouring. Yes, um, the Home Secretary gave a statement um, in the House of Commons, and it was a very powerful, very emotional statement from Priti Patel, actually, where she was talking about how unacceptable um, the actions were, and also looking at the Met policing of that vigil on Saturday night, which created which created so much of a backlash there. Um, when you look at this case, which is still gut wrenching for not just people, me and people of my generation who feel as if everyone knows someone who would have been in Sarah Everard's circumstances, um, but I think the whole of London has really felt in a, in a bad way about this, um, and. It does feel as if we are at a big moment in terms of our national conversation about violence against women, about making our streets safer. And the PM had a meeting of this new task force today where they've agreed to double the funding for safer streets. They're going to increase the number of plainclothes police officers who are patrolling areas near pubs and bars and restaurants to try and improve all those sorts of things. But the thing that's missing from this whole formula is the criminal justice system, that when you look at the tiny proportion of actual prosecutions and convictions that go down, down on violence against women. That's what really needs to be addressed. I know it's not a simple or, he or a headline grabbing thing, but that is really going to be the most important thing. And I think they are serious about trying to get something good from this horrific episode. Yep. That's where the focus needs to be. And just quickly, Rachel, uh, Labour is trying to unpick specifically the Home Secretary's role in all of this, which has been picked up by The Guardian too, uh, suggesting that Priti Patel spoke to the Met Police Commissioner before the vigil was broken up, which is, becomes interesting again, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it, it does raise the question as to what was the plan for this vigil and was the the manhandling of female protesters um, arranged in advance? I mean, did they have any sense of what they were going to do? I've spoken to people because I hosted a radio show for two hours. One of them was at the vigil. She said the police just surrounded the bandstand. There was no apparent order. There was no apparent strategy. Had they just... Um, allowed the women, there were no loos, it was very cold, the women would, could have just dispersed naturally. They kind of created their own disaster um, by not having a plan. And now we have, it's established that Priti Patel and Cressida Dick did confer before. I have to say, though, um, 
I, speaking as a woman, would find it ironic if either Priti Patel or the or the Met Commissioner mm. had to go over this issue. Um, ironic that a, a really top woman's head would roll over an issue of male violence against women. I think they are trying to do their best. And Cressida Dick has the confidence of the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister. That was made very clear. Um, mm. I know that everybody's going to hide under the cover and kick it, it, this into the long grass around the investigations that have been announced. Um, there were two in, investigations announced yesterday. Rachel. But there is money on the table as well. OK, we will talk more about that at half 11. There's plenty to discuss, isn't there? Rachel, Sebastian, thank you both. Thank you.